Thank you. <coughs> well, good morning. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank the GFA staff again for inviting me. Uh, it's always nice to be in Sao Paulo. There's always a crowd listening. So uh, thank you very much. And also to Mark Serrano. Um, I will uh, talk about ovarian stimulation, ovarian induction. And uh, here is where everything uh, starts. Uh, is it working? OK. I would like to, uh, I just uh, have some two or three slides of my own just to uh, have a background. Uh, because we're going to talk about ovarian stimulation, and this uh, comes from ovarian physiology. So we have to be very uh, knowledgeable on ovarian physiology to understand uh, the, the stimulation protocols. So in the last uh, five decades, we have been, uh, a, there has been a lot of uh, um, knowledge uh, on, on ovarian physiology based on histologic studies and afterwards on hormonal studies, and lately, especially in the last 20 years, on the new ultrasound imaging that lets us uh, know exactly the situation of the ovary. And there's a lot of new things coming up with imaging that can help us to understand the physiology. So uh, when we're stimulating, we all know from big epidemiological studies like this one that um, we need a, a certain number of eggs to have a live birth. So that has been uh, already shown by these and other authors that in the low part of the, the number of eggs, you, you, could, you would have um, a low live birth rate. And if you go up to the high numbers, especially after 20 eggs, the pregnancy rates and live birth rates will go down. So there should be a balance here <clears throat> between what is a normal stimulation, normal response, and a low, <clears throat> sorry, doesn't seem to be working. Thank you. <clears throat> so if you look at the graph, you will see there that uh, after the Bologna consensus, the criteria below uh, four eggs, up to three eggs, will uh, give you a low outcome. And after, uh, in the normal range, uh, up to 20 eggs, that would be uh, ideal. And after 20 eggs, you will see some uh, ovarian stimulation. And that would be, uh, obviously, uh, lowering pregnancy rates, too. So you have uh, this uh, middle between 4 and 20 eggs that would be uh, maybe ideal. But you know that, that that is a big spread. And it's not the same to have four or five eggs or having 16 or 17. So we have a, a, a big area there to uh, select the population for the proper stimulation protocol. So we're talking about efficacy and safety. All of this uh, talk, we'll, we'll uh, see what, what is the, most, uh, the, the best protocols for efficacy. But we have to be very conscious about safety. And, uh, in, in these uh, ASHRAE talks that I will show you, we will start with the, uh, the risk of, a, of ovarian hyperstimulation. The first talk uh, will be uh, by Polisus. He uh, works in Belgium and uh, he, uh, towards an OHSS free clinic. We have another talk on ovarian hyperstimulation by Paul de Vroy. He uh, presented uh, 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 results from an, a previous trial, the ENGAGE trial, and he stratified the patients to see their uh, risk of hyperstimulation depending on the number of follicles. Then we have a randomized control trial, a very uh, well-designed uh, protocol uh, of, a, of a lot of uh, patients and of a Danish group. And also, uh, if a GnRH antagonist uh, is, is administered uh, twice the day before HCG if that could prevent ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So going to the first uh, OHSS talk, um, this uh, was towards an OHSS free clinic. So we're all uh, in, in, the, in the business of stimulating patients and having good pregnancy rates, but we have to be very conscious about all the complications. And the OHSS is one of, of our nightmares, and we have to avoid it. 
The background uh, is uh, that the OHSS is a very serious complication that could, uh, uh, with a high morbidity and some potential mortality. And even though the ESHRE results, the EIM results show the incidence is very low, there could be some sub-registration of the OHSS because we all know that uh, mild or moderate cases could be uh, un undiagnosed. So uh, we'll probably be around an, an even higher incidence between three or five percent. So we, we need to uh, we need to avoid and, and the aim of this study is to discuss potential strategies for uh, to obtain an OHSS free clinic. <clears throat> so the, the concept of, uh, uh, of achieving an OHSS free clinic is based on three uh, basic uh, concepts. Uh, the, introduction, the introduction of GNRH antagonist in the, uh, as from especially the, the late 90s and, and beginning of the 2000s has been a, a revolution in, in our stimulation protocols because even though it, it, it wasn't uh, very quick that we, shift, uh, we, we shifted from the agonist to the antagonist protocols. Most of, of, probably most of us, most of you, are using a lot of antagonists and this has changed our practice. The use of antagonists has led us to uh, um, use the GNRH agonist to trigger the final oocyte maturation and that is another advantage of these protocols that you can avoid OHSS. And the third, uh, the third strategy is the freeze all embryos or oocytes that has been uh, achieved through the vitrification protocols. Okay, so you all know how we use the agonist triggering. We normally stimulate patients with gonadotropins. So you see the FSA champs. You start at second or third day of your cycle and you add the antagonist. That you can do it in a fixed way or you can do it in a flexible way. There's a lot of discussion about that, but mainly if you use a fixed protocol, you start in the fifth or sixth uh, stimulation day, and then you can trigger the oocyte maturation with an agonist. So um, there's a lot of, uh, you, you could uh, classify patients depending on the number of small follicles they have. So if they have, uh, between some authors say 13, 17, or even 19 follicles, or maybe a, a, an average could be 15 follicles over 11 millimeters, you should have a patient that could be at risk of hyperstimulation and you should use uh, this kind of strategies. <clears throat> so um, we knew uh, when, when the agonist triggering studies started, uh, there was a, a tremendous uh, impact on pregnancy rates. So that was uh, very uh, obvious at first. So uh, there was a, a lot of uh, protocols starting uh, with a luteal phase uh, supplementation that was called modified. Some authors like Engman, Benediva in the States used the, uh, the estradiol patches or uh, people like uh, Humaydan uh, use the protocol with uh, small boluses of uh, 1,500 units of HCG the day of the retrieval and maybe uh, two or three days later. And the modified luteal phase restores absolutely the pregnancy rate. So if you're even going to uh, trigger a cycle with an agonist, you can still be able to transfer if you have a modified luteal phase. But we have to see if that compromises uh, uh, security because we, you could have some hyperstimulation uh, with those protocols. So in conclusion, uh, the goal of IVF should not only be the pregnancy rates but the safety of the procedures. And the GNRH antagonist protocol is very useful to, uh, to uh, trigger the final oocyte maturation with an agonist and safely uh, cancel the transfer in that cycle, freeze all the embryos, and if you wish to, you could uh, transfer with a modified luteal phase. Uh, the second presentation is from Paul Devroy. Here, there was an oral presentation in, in Escher 2 about OHSS, 
And what he presented was a, a retrospe retrospective analysis of a previous uh, trial that is very well known, the ENGAGE trial, that was a trial comparing the uh, um, long-acting FSH versus a, a, a daily FSH. So the aim of this study was to do a retrospective analysis and try to stratify the population of that trial into different uh, risk uh, um, groups depending on the number of follicles over 11 millimeters that were counted uh, on during stimulation. So uh, what they did is uh, the ENGAGE trial was about 1,500 uh, uh, patients that were um, normal ovulatory uh, young patients up to 36 years of age, and they were randomized to receive uh, a daily FSH versus long-acting FSH, and after seven days, they were followed uh, with uh, some 200 units of recombinant FSH. So uh, they went into that database and they uh, stratified the population between patients having more than 19 follicles and less than 19 follicles. And that was absolutely arbitrary. Uh, Dr. DeVroy told uh, us in, in the presentation that it could have been 15 or maybe 13. But uh, they tried to establish the limit that would be very uh, obvious that those patients would be at high risk. So they, the cutoff was 19 follicles. And they uh, um, looked at the OHSS rate, the pregnancy rate, the live birth rate, and the IVF cycle failure rate. So uh, there wasn't a, a very high uh, um, incidence of OHSS in both groups about a little bit less than 2% um, in, in young patients. Obviously, there weren't any PCO patients. Uh, they were excluded from the trial at that moment. But anyway, uh, there was almost a 2% of uh, OHSS. And uh, the overall rates of OHSS were significantly higher in the patients having more than 19 follicles. As you can see there in the graph, you can have, you have an, an overall rate of 7% versus 2% between the more than 19 follicles and less than 19 follicles. And if you stratify uh, in the patients receiving the daily FSH versus the long acting, you can see that the long acting has a higher uh, OHSS rate than in the uh, daily RFSH. But anyway, in, in the daily uh, RFSH, you also have a 5% um, risk of uh, OHSS. So uh, they didn't find any significant difference in pregnancy rates or live birth rates. There you can see all the, the groups. You, you see the, the long acting, the daily, and the overall in pr clinical pregnancy rate or live birth rate, and it's pretty high in both of them and no differences between them. But the conclusion of the study is that if, if those groups of patients at a high risk with more than 19 follicles of over 11 millimeters could have been prevented with this strategy of using a, an agonist trigger. So this was a trial where they didn't use an agonist trigger, it was a previous trial, but they did a retrospective analysis. And when they stratified the population, they found that they could have been prevented uh, almost 20% uh, um, of cases, in, in especially in the group of uh, long-acting uh, FSH. The next uh, presentation is a very nice randomized clinical trial that was uh, done in, in Denmark, and it was on 1,000 cycles, the first IVF cycles. And uh, the background of this uh, study is that they were comparing the long agonist protocol versus the antagonist protocols uh, in a long period of time. And, uh, when they started the study, most of the people were using agonists, and when the study finished, uh, most of them were using antagonists, but they could, uh, I mean, not, not the people in the study, but in, in the general trend in, in, in our specialty, but uh, they, they, could, they were uh, looking at the OHSS rate and the pregnancy and live birth rates in both groups. And this is uh, an unselected population of uh, patients below 40 years of age in their first IVF cycle. And the average age was 32. 
the subject were randomized uh, in, in an agonist or antagonist protocol, and it was designed to detect a 2.5 uh, difference in pregnancy rate, um, in, sorry, in OHSS rate, and uh, the women received uh, a dose of 150 units daily of FSH if they were uh, under 36, and if they were over 36 years of age, they received 225. So uh, they, uh, they picked up, they registered all the parameters for OHSS, they used the Golang criteria, and there was a very strict um, um, following of all the patients. And well, on, in, in the two groups, you can see them there, you will find the difference especially in the total FSH dose. In the days of stimulation that are, are shorter with the antagonist protocol, and the number of eggs will be a little bit higher with the agonist protocol. So that is already known by, by everybody, but this has been uh, now shown in a very well-designed uh, uh, protocol. So the clinical outcomes were comparable also. You can see if uh, different uh, pregnancy rates, that is uh, with a, a biochemical uh, HCG uh, on the randomized patients or the positive for the ones who received the transfer, or the ongoing pregnancy rates, or the ongoing pregnancy rates per started stimulation, or the ongoing pregnancy rate per transfer. They were all across the graph. You can see there were no difference in, in clinical outcomes between both protocols. <clears throat> but the risk of OHSS was clearly different between the antagonist and the agonist protocol. Here, you can see different uh, uh, stratification depending if the patient had a low OHSS, uh, a mild OHSS, or, re or received some uh, medical uh, treatment, or was, uh, had to have an, as an ascites puncture. And you can see that the severe OHSS is clearly different between both protocols. So again, across the graph, you can see a difference between uh, the OHSS risk between one and, and, and the antagonist and the agonist protocol. So in this large randomized control trial of over 1,000 patients with a broad inclusion criteria, normal unselected population, there were similar uh, pregnancy outcomes, but the safety profile was in favor of the antagonist protocol. So um, my last presentation on the uh, OHSS uh, of my talk will be uh, on a paper um, on GnRH antagonist administration, a double dose of uh, um, a GnRH antagonist on the previous, on the day previous to the uh, HCG administration. So there was, this was a poster presented in the ESHRE. Um, the, the, the background is the same. We've been talking uh, that the antagonist protocols could lower the incidence of OHSS, but maybe not eliminate it completely. And uh, the, the, the strategy uh, of the authors was administering a double dose of 0.25 milligrams of an antagonist the previous day uh, of the uh, ACG in risk uh, in patients at risk. So there was a single center, a double blind randomized uh, control trial of uh, a little bit under 200 patients, sorry. So 194 IVF and ICSI patients at risk of OHSS. And uh, they were divided, randomized in two groups. Group A received a double dose of 0.25 milligrams, uh, 12 hours apart, the day before ACG. That was a double dose group. And another 97 patients that only received the conventional single dose. And in both groups, the, the FSH dose was tapered to 100 units uh, per day, the day of the allocation of the treatment that was remember the day before of ACG administration. So the primary outcomes the authors were looking at was the rate of early and late OHSS, clinical pregnancy rate, and the secondary endpoints was the values or levels of, the, of circulating estradiol, LH, and progesterone. So as you can see in that table uh, between the, the group and uh, the, the, the 
The control group would be the, the group B, and group A would be the double dose group. And you can see there that there was the early onset OHSS was zero in the double dose group and was 12% uh, in the conventional dose. Pregnancy rates were not compromised in either groups. You can see the pregnancy rates were fairly normal, uh, between 40 and 50 percent in, in either groups, per cycle or per transfer. So um, there were no differences in, in, in the demographics of the population in age, recombinant uh, FSH dose, and number of oocytes retrieved. And as you can see, there were no differences in the pregnancy rates. So. Uh, Clinical pregnancy uh, rates and pregnancy loss was not significantly different, but the OHSS rate was really lower in, in the uh, double dose group. As you can see there, you will also see some differences in the estradiol levels. In the antagonist, double dose will be lower as well as the LH and the progesterone. That, that is easily uh, uh, shown there. So, uh, a double dose of GnRH antagonists had significantly lower levels of, of these hormones. So the conclusion is that a double dose of GnRH antagonists could be helpful in patients that you see that could be at high risk of OHSS. So you could uh, increase the dose of, of the antagonist the day before of HEG and trigger with HEG uh, normally. So uh, we'll go to the, the second and last part of my presentation that will be manage, management of the poor ovarian responders. That's the other uh, side of, of the same coin. So we are looking on safety and efficacy. And we, we all have these kind of patients. It's uh, a problem that we will have uh, on and on in, in the coming years because of the shift of, of the population's age at first treatment. So we all have to manage poor responders, unfortunately, and we need to establish uh, strategies to optimize stimulation protocols in poor responders. So we'll see three presentations here, one from India, that is supplementation of recombinant LH in poor responders in the mid-follicular phase. Um, and they, they, they would uh, culture in, to the plasticist stage and uh, look at the pregnancy and implantation rate. A second paper by Asakura uh, on the dual stimulation protocol using a two-step consecutive control ovarian stimulation in oocyte retrieval in the follicular and luteal phase. There is very interesting uh, new strategy that has been used lately in, in oncofertility too. And the use, finally, the use of growth hormone in poor prognosis patients that has uh, been uh, um, presented as a poster in Eshre by Aispurua. So the first uh, paper by uh, Dr. Chimote from India was the supplementation of recombinant LH to poor responders in mid-follicular phase, along with the recombinant FSH, resulting in better blastocyst formation and implantation rate in an antagonist protocol. So uh, the authors, uh, uh, introduced uh, the, the talk and saying that there is a lot of papers that are looking at LH supplementation and even though uh, two randomized studies showed uh, an improvement in, in patients over 36, the big randomized studies looking at LH supplementation haven't uh, shown uh, a, a, a significant effect of LH supplementation, but it could be uh, useful in patients in a certain population of patients, especially the population over 35. So the aim of the study was to determine whether the addition of exogenous LH to an FSH protocol uh, improves pregnancy rates in poor responders. So the population they studied, uh, this was a randomized clinical study along, uh, along two years. And 106 patients uh, defined as poor responder with an AMH below 1.2 nanogram milliliters and an AFC count of under six uh, undergoing IVF or ICSI. Patients were stimulated with recombinant FSH at a dose of 150 units per day as from cycle two. And at cycle day six, they were randomized to receive an additional uh, supplement of uh, RLH in addition to the FSH in an antagonist protocol. 
So there were 54 women receiving uh, LH and 52 women uh, receiving only FSH and the antagonist. Of these women, 42 women in each group, almost uh, an 80 5% received a blastocyst transfer. So you can see there in the table that the days of uh, stimulation were uh, slightly uh, shorter when you use the LH as from day six. And also they found uh, a higher number of eggs retrieved, uh, 7.5 versus 5.3. So uh, they, they had fewer days of stimulation and a higher uh, retrieval rate. The embryological and endometrial parameters, you can see there that the cleavage rate of, uh, and, and the blastocyst uh, uh, rate, that the cleavage rate was a, a little bit higher in the LH group, but that was not very uh, uh, significant, but it was higher. And the endometrial thickness uh, was higher in the LH group too, and the endometrial grade, the pattern, the quality of the endometrium they found was different too. So um, the use of recombinant LH increased endometrial thickness and grade, and that suggests some better receptivity. And the use of recombinant LH also increased oocyte quality because they improved uh, the cleavage rates. Clinical pregnancy rates uh, were significantly higher. We have to bear in mind that it's a small population, only 50 patients in each uh, side but there was a clinical pregnancy rate that was higher in the LH group and the implantation rate was higher also. So there could be a, a good point here in supplementation of LH uh, in, in addition to the recombinant FSH in an antagonist protocol in four responders that could improve the endometrial receptivity and implantation rates and the clinical pregnancy rate that obviously has to be uh, shown with a larger data set. So the next paper is a two-step consecutive controlled ovarian stimulation and oocyte retrieval in the follicular and luteal phase that could increase the chance of obtaining embryos in patients with diminished ovarian reserve. You know that um, patients with poor ovarian, very poor ovarian reserve especially will have a high cancellation rate, a high uh, transfer cancellation rate, and a low um, pregnancy rate. So, the strategy these authors were looking at was to evaluate the efficacy of consecutively uh, stimulating uh, the, the ovaries of women with poor ovarian response. And this is based on uh, physiological studies that have been uh, going on in, in lately that have been shown that we have, the, the, that the humans have, as has been shown in cows and other animals too, they have different follicular waves there, there could be two follicular waves, one in the beginning of the cycle and a second one in the luteal phase. And they showed also that patients that could be patients that have long cycles that more than 30, 35 days, they could have a third ovarian uh, wave uh, cycle. So, so you could have, especially in patients that could be uh, having long cycles, you could have a third cycle here uh, a third wave that could be uh, uh, receptive, the ovaries would be receptive to stimulation. So this has been very useful in oncology patients that need to quickly start a stimulation and a lot of authors have shown now that you can start that in the, in the middle of a luteal uh, phase cycle. Obviously you would, wouldn't be able to transfer these embryos because the, the endometrium won't be prepared uh, appropriately. So. Uh, these uh, authors uh, designed a prospective clinical trial of two-step ART in 21 cycles. It's a pilot study during a 12-month period uh, and 20 patients, really uh, high-age patients, over 41, uh, with diminished ovarian reserve participated. Patients were stimulated with an antagonist uh, stimulation protocol and they received a, a conventional follicle oocyte retrieval followed by four or five days uh, of a resting period and a new stimulation protocol starting in luteal phase with a late luteal uh, retrieval uh, of eggs. So all of the embryos that were uh, obtained, uh, the day two and three embryos were vitrified and not transferred, and they were transferred in, in another cycle. 
So you can see here that even though it's a, it's a very uh, a small uh, study of 21 cycles, uh, patients that could cryopreserve in follicular phase retrieval were three cycles of the 21. Uh, there were four cycles that could cryopreserve embryos in the luteal phase, and there were patients that could uh, cryopreserve in both of the uh, retrievals uh, some embryos. So the number of vitrified embryos uh, could be um, increased in an 80% from five that would have been obtained in a follicular phase to nine that finally were obtained. So these are very poor uh, ovarian reserve patients. You can see that they have a low number of embryos that could be vitrified, but the stimulation, the, this kind of protocol, allowed them to, to uh, vitrify more embryos that, that would have been in only one stimulation uh, cycle. So a total of nine cycles had vitrified, and four of them had oocytes only in the luteal phase. Um, the fertilization and embryo quality uh, rates were similar between uh, follicular and luteal phase oocytes. You can see there the cryopreservation percentage per cycle is almost the same. And uh, the uh, only uh, observation that could uh, be uh, a little bit worrying is that they saw more uh, atresia, atresia follicles in, in the luteal phase that, that could be understandable. Uh, but we don't know about the safety and, and the uh, long uh, follow-up of, of embryos obtained from luteal phase. But we, these uh, authors had two clinical pregnancies after transferring uh, uh, embryos from a luteal phase retrieval. So this is a very promising uh, studies that could help a lot of patients. And the conclusion is that the additional retrieval during luteal phase increases the chance of obtaining embryos in a short period of time in patients with diminished ovarian reserve. Okay, in my last presentation now from uh, uh, Spain, from Dr. Aispurua, was the use of a human growth hormone in poor prognosis patients uh, that improves euploidy and good quality blastocyst rate. That was a patient controlled trial, and uh, the authors. Uh, stated that the supplementation of HGH is, as an adjuvant therapy has been uh, shown that could increase pregnancy rates, although the, the most recent, most recent uh, systematic review uh, is, is only of uh, three or four papers, and the, the total number of cycles is around 180. So it's a very small population that has been uh, studied. And these authors uh, state that few studies uh, confirm these findings now. So they evaluated the use of human growth hormone during ovarian stimulation in patients with poor prognosis. And they uh, looked at maturity, fertilization rate, blastocyst uh, rate, good quality blastocyst. And the nice thing about this study is that they uh, used uh, CGH to... Uh, establish uh, the euploidy of blastocyst. So, so uh, this was uh, very uh, novel for this, uh, for this uh, growth hormone uh, papers that haven't been looking at this. So uh, this was a single center comparative randomized patient control trial between uh, 2013 and 2014. Uh, 28 poor prognosis patients, they were over 40 and had at least three or more failed IVF cycles and they underwent ovarian stimulation using an antagonist protocol, an agonist trigger, and uh, they underwent two consecutive cycles in, in within a six month period. In one of them, alternatively, they used uh, uh, growth hormone during uh, five weeks, and uh, that was in a dose of one unit per day. And uh, the other cycle was a conventional cycle not using uh, human growth and more. So estradiol and progesterone were measured on the trigger day, and PGS was performed using trophectoderm biopsy and RSA-CGH. So you, here you can see the euploid blastocyst and pregnancy rate that was significantly higher in the human growth hormone cycles. You can see there that the 44% versus uh, 23 percent pregnancy rate. And these are old patients with poor prognosis. 
And uh, the euploid state was 30% of euploid blastesis versus 3% of euploid blastesis in the, uh, on the side that didn't use growth hormone. You can see that the blastocyst uh, rate is around 30%, a little bit lower than, than normal, but these are poor prognosis patients. Uh, even though the number of oocytes retrieved could, could uh, uh, not be um, uh, very representative of a poor prognosis, but there were old patients with, uh, failed, uh, with three or more failed IVF cycles, uh, previous IVF cycles. So the addition of human growth hormone during a variant stimulation in patients with poor prognosis it improves implantation and pregnancy rates in this paper, <clears throat> in addition to improving top quality and euploid blastocyst rates. The number of retrieved oocytes, maturity, fertilization, and blastocyst rate were not different uh, under the influence of GH. And the clinical implications is that the, the growth hormone as an adjuvant in IVF cycles may represent a valid option in patients with pro poor prognosis to improve the oocyte quality and the chromosomal content of the embryo. Okay, so uh, just as a summary, we have uh, uh, looked at uh, two sides of, of, of the coin, the safety and efficacy. We're looking at OHSS risk. We saw both papers on um, achieving an OHSS free clinic, uh, strategies to do that, especially GnRH antagonist protocols, GnRH agonist triggering, and freeze all strategies. Those three uh, strategies would be uh, a summary of Paulisa's uh, presentation. On uh, Paul Devroy's presentation, uh, we saw that if you stratify patients and if you identify patients that are at high risk, especially patients with more than 19 follicles, you could avoid uh, a lot of hyperstimulation um, um, cases by triggering the final oocyte maturation with an agonist. And that would be the suggested uh, strategy for uh, um, avoiding OHSS. In the paper by Toftiger from Denmark, uh, we saw that there were similar pregnancy rates and outcomes between the antagonist and the agonist uh, protocols, but again, you can, you can see a lowering of the OHSS risk with the antagonist protocol. And the paper by Ravanos that uh, showed that a double dose of GnRH antagonist the day before HCG could uh, avoid uh, OHSS in high-risk patients. And that could be easily done uh, in, in our daily practice. And the ovarian and in the poor ovarian uh, responder uh, Papers presented, uh, we saw the, the, uh, the randomized controlled trial of uh, LH supplementation day six in a recombinant FSH antagonist protocol that could improve pregnancy and implantation rates. Even though it's a, it's a small number, it, it could be very uh, promising. And uh, the paper of a two-step consecutive cycle, where you, we saw that uh, follicle retrieval and a luteal retrieval could increase the number of embryos obtained in these uh, poor uh, response patients. And the last paper we, uh, I presented was uh, the poster by Aispurua that showed an improvement in the quality and the euploid state of blastocyst in patients receiving five weeks of uh, one unit per day of growth hormone to a FSH antagonist protocol and triggering with agonist. So that's all. Thank you very much.